I thank you, God, for this opportunity, God, to speak your word. So, Lord, hide me behind your cross and may they hear your words and not my own. In the name of Jesus, then I pray. Father, there's people here that are sick in body. I pray for Debbie Clark. Pray for continued healing in her shoulder, God. Pray for Jamie, God, for continued healing in his body and his jaw. God, I pray that he would be able to eat regularly soon. God, this port would be able to be taken out soon, God. Pray in the name of Jesus. Father, there's others here. God, I thank you for Brother Lawrence being here and the, the, the blessing that you've uh, enabled him and Brother Bart to be here today. You've, you've brought them back. You've rehabilitated them. We thank you, God, for strength in their body. Lord, be with us now as we look into your word. May we be doers of your word and not hearers. And may we leave this place encouraged. May we leave this place with power from the Most High. And if you want that for your life, can you say amen? Come on, let's give God praise in this place. You can be seated. Let me bring you up to speed on what's going on here in chapter 1. This is John, uh, one of the 12 original disciples of Christ. Uh, and if you read from verse 9, right before this, you'll see that John was on an island called Patmos. And the reason that he was there is because he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Christ. And he was exiled to this island. No doubt John uh, thought this was the end for him. He thought that he would be on this island for the rest of his life. He thought that the end was nigh, but redemption was nigh. Amen. Amen. And so it was on that island that Jesus came to John. It was on that island that Jesus would give John the best revelation of his life, and that would be the book of Revelation. John was up in age, and like I said, he was exiled. And the island was there for him as a form of punishment. This is where criminals would be taken. They would be exiled. And so this is also where out, the outcasts would be taken. The people uh, that were not like the others, the other uh, Jews and, and different people during that time. I believe that, that John thought that this would be his final resting place. That this island, this prison would be his final destination. And in this passage, we see that John was afraid. In fact, Jesus looked upon him and he could tell that he was frightened. I'm not really sure why he was afraid. I think he had many fears. And I, that's really where I'm coming from this morning. I believe that there's some folks in this place that fear is your driving factor when Jesus should be your driving factor. I believe that fear rules your life instead of you using fear for something positive. And so that's where I'm coming from. John was afraid, no doubt. He was on an island, uh, probably by himself, or wasn't many people there. And the people that were there were criminals, more, more than likely. And then when he saw the Lord, he felt scared. He had seen Jesus before. He had seen Jesus after the resurrection. I don't know if he felt shame. Maybe he didn't feel good enough to be in the presence of the Lord. Uh, maybe he second-guessed what he was doing. Maybe he didn't recognize Jesus. But then and there is when Jesus did a few things for Brother John. And that's the things that I want to speak to you about this morning. Three things. And the first thing is this. Jesus meets us on our island. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, the first part of it, when I saw Him, I fell at His feet as though dead. The first thing that you need to understand from these verses in Scripture, it, I don't want you to necessarily focus on eschatology, the end times, but what I want you to focus on and what I want you to understand from this passage is what I feel the Lord speaking in my heart for this congregation for today, on July 21st, 2019, that Jesus meets us in our island. An island is a place of loneliness. An island is a place of fear. An island is a place that appears to have no hope. An island is a place that appears to have no end. An island is a place where we think it's our final resting place. And I don't believe Jesus is saying that to us today. I believe that out of this place and out of this island will come our best days. You can take that corporately as a church. I believe that with all my heart, that our best days are ahead. And you can take that personally, 
that your best days are ahead. And though you may be old in body, listen, John was old in body, but his greatest achievement come from the island as Jesus met him there. And so, in that moment of despair, in that moment of helplessness and hopelessness, Jesus comes to meet him and he comes to meet us today. I think about David as he spent most of his time running, uh, or a lot of his life running. If we think about King David that, that slayed Goliath, we think about King David who accomplished all these things for the kingdom of God. We think about King David as the man whom uh, had the, the heart of God. And we forget that most of David's life, or at least a lot of it, he spent running from people. He spent his life running from King Saul. He spent his life running from his son Absalom and all of his posse who tried to take over his kingdom. And in Psalm chapter 7, verse 1 through 2, we see a prayer that David prays as he's running from King Saul. Lord my God, I take refuge in, in you. Save and deliver me from all who pursue me, or they will tear me apart like a lion and rip me to pieces with no one to rescue me. In other words, what he's saying is, God, I can't do this without you. I, I'm going to be torn to pieces if you don't help me. But God, I know you're my refuge, and I know you can help me. And so I'm coming to you in my island, and I'm asking you to meet me there. And in each of these moments where David was on an island, he seemed helpless. This powerful warrior, this man that killed, do you remember what was said? What, what, what the echo was? Saul, King, King Saul killed a thousand, but King David King, killed tens of thousands. And here this man was, and he was running. He was gifted, but he was running. Oh, do you hear that this morning? He was talented, but he was running. He had a call on his life, but he was running. He was on an island. And we go through times in our life where it doesn't matter how good we are. It doesn't matter what you've accomplished in the past. There comes a point where we're on an island. And you feel lonely and you feel helpless and you, you have fear that is leading your life instead of God leading your life. You may even feel like dying. You may feel ashamed. If you've accomplished something great in your life and then you do something wrong in your life, I believe you're in greater shame than if you wouldn't have even accomplished anything. Maybe that's where you're at in the island of your life. Listen, you need to understand this morning that Jesus meets you there. And I'm here to testify this morning that His mercy is greater than your sin. We don't understand that. His mercy is greater than our sin. He doesn't want us to stay in our sin. His mercy is enough to cover our sin. And His mercy is powerful enough to change our mentality to do a 180 and to turn from our sin. That's how great His mercy is. And His mercy meets us on this island. There comes a point where maybe you are there. You're surrounded by this water. There's no way out. And I want you to know that Jesus is there with you. You don't have to be alone you don't have to feel lonely. Oh, get that now. You're not alone, so therefore don't feel lonely. Don't let your feelings mess up what God wants to do in your life. We give too much clout to our feelings when we just need to do what God tells us to do, no matter if we feel like it or not. And so maybe you're on that island and you don't feel like serving God. Just know that Jesus is there with you regardless if you want Him there or not. I believe that. And so... David called out to God in, in Psalm 7, and then we read in, in Psalm 31, after the smoke had cleared, he said this, Praise be to the Lord, for He showed me the wonders of His love when I was in a city under siege. In my alarms, hear that, in my alarms. Some of you are alarmed about things. Some of you are worried about things. Some of you are fearful about things. But in your alarm, I said, I'm cut off from your sight. Yet you heard my cry, for mercy when I called out to you for help. He's testifying that God was with him in, his city, in, in the city that was under siege. He was with him on that island because Jesus met him there. You're not alone. You don't have to be afraid. This isn't the end. And Look back at John here on the island of Patmos. Get this. What seemed to be his demise 
what seemed to be his end turned into something beautiful. There's a song out that says God makes beautiful things out of the messes. I'm so grateful for that today. Jesus met him there, and out of his greatest trial came John's greatest accomplishment. Jesus gave him the book of Revelation. He saw things that nobody else had ever seen. He went places that nobody else had ever seen this side of eternity. Sometimes, for God to get our attention, sometimes, for God to do something great in our lives, we have to go through trials and we have to go through tribulation. And it's out of the island in which God will birth our greatest accomplishment. We have to endure some things. Amen. Brother William said this in our board meeting on Tuesday night. The trials and the tribulations are to shape our life. And the lessons that we learn in the trial, the lessons that we learn in the highland, is going to turn into our greatest accomplishment. But we can't be afraid and we can't back down and we can't change our belief and we can't change who we are. We've just got to hold in there and understand that Jesus meets us there. And so, I just encourage you when you're on the island to look for Jesus. When you're on the island, you need to know He's there. Just begin to look for Him. So many times we're on the island and we forget to look for Jesus. We get focused on the tangles in our legs. We get focused on the things that hold us down. We get focused on the things that trip us up and forget to look for the Savior who can clear up all things. Out of your greatest trial, God births our greatest accomplishment. I think about a woman during childbirth. Out of her greatest pain, Out of her greatest pain is birthed her greatest accomplishment. Out of all the pain and struggle that comes through a pregnancy, the greatest gift, the most precious gift is birthed. Your greatest accomplishment will come out of times when you're on the island because Jesus meets you there. That's the first point. The second point is this. This has been in my spirit for two weeks. Jesus touches us in our island. He don't just meet you there, but He touches you. He reaches out His hand and He lays it on your shoulder and He says, do not be afraid. He says, you're not alone. In your island, Jesus reaches out to touch us. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, the second part, Then He placed His right hand on me. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to be good. First, let's talk about this hand. Just the hand. You can go to that next slide. He placed His hand on Him. It's a beautiful moment. And if you can just get into your mind what is happening here. The one true God the Savior of the world, the Son of God, the Son of Man, reaches out His hand and places it on John. During those days, kings would not even speak to peasants. In those days, nobility would not even give a moment of time to someone of lesser stature than them. But Jesus, the King of all kings, reaches out His hand in the middle of John's hurt and in the middle of John's trial and touches him. Why did He do this? It's because Jesus saw the distress that He was in. Jesus saw the fear that He was in. Jesus saw the loneliness. Jesus saw this and He was sympathetic to John. He sympathized with him. He saw that John needed more than words. He needed more than words. He needed a touch. And so, Jesus, being who He is, He saw the need and He met the need. He saw what John needed and He responded. He understood what John was going through. He saw where John was at emotionally. And He connected with him on more than one level with a physical touch even going beyond with words. 
In that moment, He comforted John. He placed His hands on him. And you guys know, there's just something special about receiving a hug from somebody. There's something special about somebody touching you. Those of you who are married in this place, you know what that means. You, there's an intimacy there when, when somebody touches you in a certain way. And that's what Jesus was doing to John. He's like, John, I understand what you're going through. And I want you to know that I'm closer than a brother. I want you to know that I'm here. I'm with you. And He puts His hand on John. That touch meant a lot of things. But one thing that it meant is that Jesus was real. John wasn't hallucinating. John felt the touch of the Savior of the world. And when Jesus touched him, he knew. When Jesus touched him, he knew that he was real. Let that be a faith moment for you right in this place. It was a real touch. In this moment, we see how personal Jesus was. It's another thing that is meant by this placing of the hand. It signified that He understood what He was going through. He comforted Him and he, he placed His hand on Him because He was real. He placed His hand on Him because He was personal. He placed His hand on Him because He sympathized with what He was going through. He touched me. Oh, He touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know He touched me, and He made me whole. Can we sing that together? He touched me. Oh, He touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened. And now I know He touched me and He made me whole. Hallelujah. Can you give God praise? Thank you, Jesus. He touched me and He made me whole. Oh, let me say it again. He touched me and He made me whole. And you need to know this morning on your island that He can touch you and He can make you whole. Some of you are fighting things that is not your battle. You're on this island and you're trying to box your way off of this island. And Jesus says this, I'm meeting you there. And He says this, I'm touching you in that moment. I'm going to make you whole. I'm going to give you what you need. I'm going to respond to your needs today. I believe that with all my heart. Thank you, Jesus. Do you remember when He touched you for the first time? Some of you need to remember that. Some of you need to go back to that day when it all changed. When something leaped within you. When something you felt inside of you that you never felt before. He touched you and He made you whole. I've been singing that song around my house. My, my, my mother is here and, and my grandparents, Lewis and Rachel Pallier, are here and they're sitting there. Welcome you guys here. It's an honor for you to be here. Amen. If you see them, say hey to them. My grandparents owned an Ace Hardware for 20 years and that's how they made their living. And, and uh, I got a lot, of, a lot of great things from them. And they blessed my life. Going back to what I was saying, <laughs> Jesus touches you in the island. You need to go back to that day when He touched you. You need to remember that. Remember that. Remember that time that He placed His divine hand on the lowly peasant called Adam Williams and changed his life forevermore. You need to remember that time that He come to you when you didn't deserve it. And He touched you and He made you whole. Praise the Lord that He did that. It gets better though. Because He didn't just place His hand on Brother John. 
Brother Jack, he placed his right hand. He placed his right hand on Brother John in our Wednesday night Bible study. Jack, Jack Knuckles, he asked, what is, what, you think there's something significant about the right hand? And I said, absolutely. I said, I'm going to study it and I'm going to come back to you. Well, here it is, John. Uh, here it is, Jack. Uh, here it is, his right hand. Four P words. If you're taking notes, first thing that his right hand means is prestige. The right hand in Scripture is used as a symbol of honor. In Mark chapter 16, Acts chapter 2, and Acts chapter 7, Jesus' position to the Father is that He is on the right hand of God. It means that He is held to a higher honor than anybody else. And so, when Jesus places His right hand on John, it means that He placed Him in a position of prestige, in a position of honor. The second thing is proximity. The fact that Jesus placed His right hand on God, a right hand on John, meant that He was close to John. It goes back to what I've already stated. It, it meant that, that He was right by Him, that He was closer than a brother. He was letting Him know that I am right here. I'm close to you. The third P word is power. It signifies in the Bible power and authority in which Jesus granted John. Now think about what He is getting ready to do. He's getting ready to birth and to give us the book of Revelation. And so in this moment, Jesus is validating John for the task that He's getting ready to give him. And He's saying to John, I'm, you are in high honor, sir and I'm close to you, and I'm giving you power that no man has ever seen. I'm getting ready to birth you my revelation of the eschatology, the end times. And so by Jesus placing His right hand on John, that's the first three things. And the fourth thing is protection. Jesus extends His right hand to comfort John and to let him know that everything is going to be alright. And He's letting him know that I am going to protect you on this island called Patmos. He reaches this right hand which is signified in the Bible as a strong hand. The strong hand of the Lord to, to indicate that He will protect with His heavenly power. I think about Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. So do not fear for I am with you, do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I believe that God offers all these things, not just to John today, but I believe that He offers those things to us in the middle of our island. He reaches out with His right hand to touch us in the middle of our island. You need to know that. You need to know that no matter where you're at in your life, no matter, no matter whatever stature you are, no matter how much money you make, you're in a place of honor to God. Let me say that again. You're prestige to Him. The Bible calls us heirs and co-heirs of Christ. He does not call us to be orphans, but He calls us as His sons and daughters. In other words, you need to understand that there is honor tied to your name. There is prestige tied to your name. You're not a peasant. You're not an outcast. You're someone of value to the Lord. You need to know that. In your island, in your trial, in your troubles, whatever you're going through, in your fear, in your loneliness, you need to know that God honors you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how filthy your life has been. You mean something to God. And He can turn it around if you'll start to believe that about yourself. Amen. It means that He's close to you in proximity. It means that He's giving you power. And it means that He's there to protect you. Get that in your mind this morning, those P words, because that's what God offers us today in the middle of our island. The, four, uh, the third thing today is Jesus. He, he meets us in our island. He touches us in our island, but He also speaks to us in our island. He speaks to us in our island. 
And truthfully, there's a couple things here. This is not on my notes. He's got a small, still small voice. And I think sometimes when we're in the island, we've got so much noise around us that we cannot hear that still small voice. Or, we're not creating an atmosphere for Him to speak to us. Now, He can speak to us at any time, but what I'm, what I'm meaning is we're not pausing to hear. We're not creating an atmosphere of worship in our home. We're not creating... We've got things around our lives that will, will drown out His still small voice. There's worldly things in our life that we need to crush in order for us to hear His voice in the island. We've got to get desperate enough in the island to get everything out of the way so that we can hear His voice. We've got to get desperate enough in the island before we hit rock bottom, before we get in trouble, before we uh, go through a divorce, before we do something dumb, we've got to, 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 to push everything worldly out so that we can hear that still small voice. Because the truth is, He is trying to speak to you. But we've got to give Him allowance to do that. We've got to we'll open our hearts for what He's really trying to say to us when we're in these moments. Amen. Jesus told John, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. Listen, for you in your life, the island can be scary. The island is the unknown. And many of you have, have, have been through times in your life where you don't know the outcome of something. That is the worst place to be. The unknown, when you don't know how it's going to end, or you don't know what your sickness is, or when you don't know uh, whether you need surgery or not, or, or you don't know uh, what the sickness is in your body, or you, you don't know uh, what's going to happen with your children, you don't know how this is going to look. And so, in the unknown, we get freaked out, we get scared. And here's what Jesus says to us, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. Amen. I hold the keys to death and Hades. Don't you get to thinking that I'm not in charge. Don't you get to thinking that I'm not there with you. Don't you be scared. Don't you be scared in the unknown. Don't you know that John was in the unknown. He didn't, he'd never been to that island. He didn't. He didn't vacation there every now and then. He'd never been to the island of Patmos. It was unknown. He didn't know what his future would hold. But Jesus speaks to us there in the unknown. Do not be afraid. And in case you didn't know that, and in case you didn't know why you don't need to be afraid, I want to I wanna just, in closing, I want to tell you this. It's like when you go to, the, to a new doctor, and, and, they're, and, they're, and, and they're like, okay, who... A new doctor comes in, you're like, okay, who are you? Uh, well, I went to the University of Virginia, I graduated with honors. All right, now you start trusting this guy a little bit more, right? Or this gal. Uh, okay, uh, I've been doing this for, for 13 years. Uh, I've, I've, I've done uh, thousands of these surgeries. And you start feeling better, right? You start feeling better about the hands in which you're in, right? Okay, or, or, or maybe uh, when, uh, when you're you're looking at a new job. They want to know all your qualifications. They want to know, what, have you done this before? Are you able to learn something new? Uh, do you have any certificates? Do you have, are you certified in anything? Are you licensed in anything? They want to know that, right? Because then they can trust you. Well, Jesus here is saying this to John. Hey, I just want you to know, you don't have to be afraid because I'm qualified to handle every one of your situations. I'm qualified to handle you here on this island. You're in my hands. And let me tell you who I am. I am the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, but now I'm alive. And I hold the keys to death, hell, and the grave. That's who I am. In case you forgot, I'm the one in charge. I'm the one who formed you in your mother's womb. I'm the one that was there at the beginning. Amen. That's who I am. And I want you to know that you lay in my hands, but I want you to know I'm qualified to handle whatever you're going through. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so in this, he's saying, I'm sovereign. I'm the first and the last. He's saying, I'm salvation. I'm the living one. And he's saying, I am the strength. I have the power. I have the skill. Because I hold the keys to everything in this world and in the world to come. If that isn't good enough for you today, I don't know what is. If it sounds good to you today, then I encourage you to get on the wagon called Jesus. Get on board, strap in, call Him your Lord and Savior, and head to that place that He has for you in all of eternity. Amen. Can you give Him praise?